This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Welcome back to our study of lesson number two. We're talking about man's problem with sin from the beginning of time and God's wonderful solution, His abundant love as embodied in His beloved Son, Jesus the Christ. And in this last section of our study, we're studying some of the reasons that the Christian can know that Jesus is our best friend. We've seen that we know that He's our best friend by His life upon this earth by His humiliation and suffering for us, by His death and His shed blood. And in this last several classes, we've been studying about His resurrection and His present reign or rule as King of kings and Lord of Lord. We want to express our appreciation to you for your interest in God's Word. We also want to stress to you the importance of continuing to work on your memory work and want to give you as the memory ver uh, verse for this class, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And we studied that in our last class, and we saw that it said that Jesus is the one mediator between man and God. And we're thankful that He serves that function. Since He has been raised from the dead and ruling as King in heaven, He is our mediator. We want to continue now along those lines and look at several other passages of Scripture showing us some things that Jesus is or does in His capacity as ru uh, ruling as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's look now in the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 29. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Here God, through the Apostle Paul, tells us that the Lord nourishes and cherishes His church. Now, the word nourish has with it the idea of feeding and taking care of tenderly and lovingly. Jesus feeds His church through His Word. It is His Word that is described as the sincere milk that the Christian needs to grow, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. And it's the, His Word that is described as the strong, solid meat, solid food in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. So Jesus is still alive. He's still in His church, working in His church through His Word and through His uh, providence, providing for His church. And we're thankful that He does that. He nourishes us through His Word. But He also cherishes His church. That is, He places a high value upon it. He loves His church. He's shown that He loved His church by His willingness to suffer and bleed and die to purchase that church with His own precious blood. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. So Jesus nourishes and cherishes His church. He takes care of His body. And we're not talking about any miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit or anything of that nature. But we are talking about the fact that He is here. He is among us. He is nourishing us as we feed on His wonderful Word, even at this very time. So Jesus nourishes and cherishes His spiritual body, the church. Then another passage, this one in John 14, verse 6. John 14, verse 6. Here we see the wonderful words recorded in John's account of the gospel. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very exclusive language used by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
saying, I am the way. The way what? The way to, light, to live. The way to heaven. The only way. The life. The truth. The word of God expressed in a beautiful way through his life upon this earth. But he said, no one comes to me except through the Father. So we know that he is the only way to go to heaven where the Father is located. And if we want to approach God and if we want to spend eternity in heaven, then we're going to have to do it through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by being his disciples, his pupils, his learners, those who follow him and strive to obey his will, those who continue in his word, in the reading of it, and, and the applying of that word to our daily lives. He is the only access we have to the Father. It is through whom, him whom we pray, as we've seen in passages like Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. So the only approach that we have to the Father is through His beloved Son, Jesus the Christ. And those religions who try to approach God by any other means are not going to receive what they're striving for according to the Savior. That's not something that we have made up out of our own mind. We're just trusting Him in His Word. He says He's the only way to the Father. And so we want to approach God through Him. While we're here on this earth, in prayer. And when we leave this life, we want to approach God, the Father, through His beloved Son to spend eternity in heaven with Him. And then in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. This is a beautiful passage of Scripture that tells us one of the blessings of being a Christian. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What a wonderful passage. Can you see in these verses the Lord talking to us and showing that He is a place of refuge, a place to go in times of trial and difficulties as we approach the Father through Him in prayer, as we think about Him and how He has promised to always be by our side. Jesus calls us. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, are loaded down with the work of doing the kingdom of God. And he says, I promise you that if you come to me, you're going to find rest. You're going to find the rest that you need. In verse 29, he talks about a yoke. And of course, we know that a yoke is an instrument that we put upon uh, an animal of some kind, a cow or an oxen, so that we can gain work from that oxen. And that's what the Lord is talking about. We need to put on His yoke. That is, we need to be actively involved in His work. We need to be laboring for Him. And that labor needs to be a labor of love, a labor of joy, a labor of thanksgiving that we can serve Him. And he says if we take his yoke upon him, upon us and we work in his vineyard, if you will, in his kingdom, then we're going to receive rest for our souls. And you see, those ideas are normally not connected together by man. That is work and rest. But that's what Jesus is saying, that we ought to approach our labor for him as a way of rest, that is, as a way of satisfaction, of gaining uh, appreciation and thanksgiving, that we can serve Him in that way by doing His work. And He says, learn of me, for I am gentle 
We need to learn of the Lord and we need to strive to walk in His steps as we've seen earlier in our study. We learn of Him as we read His Word and we meditate upon His Word. And that's how we learn the work that we ought to do in serving the Lord. And then in verse 30, he says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is, if we have the right attitude and the right spirit, we will be engaged in a labor of love, as Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll be enjoying the work that we do for the Lord, and we'll find rest and satisfaction and peace in that. And I believe that is involved in this, we can be looking forward to a better rest. As the Hebrew writer talked about in the fourth chapter of the Hebrew letter, he said, There yet remains a rest for the people of God, looking forward to the time when we leave this life and this earth and go to a better place prepared for those who are willing to follow Jesus wherever he would lead through his word and through his example. So Jesus is a place of refuge. We ought to think of him in times of trial and difficulty and rejoice in our relationship with him because he is truly the best friend that we could ever have. And that finishes our study of this particular thought his rule, his reign after his resurrection from the dead. And so we'd like to briefly summarize the verses that we've seen in these last two classes. We began with 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, the verse that we've assigned as your memory verse. We've seen that in his capacity as ruler, King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus is the one mediator between God and man the one who can join together man and God. And we're thankful that he does that for the faithful Christian. Then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he is our advocate. And again, we talked about that term means our lawyer, our defense attorney, one who is defending us in the courts of heaven, defending us against the accusations being made by Satan, against us. And then in the Hebrew letter in chapter 7 verse 25, we learn that he ever lives to make intercession to those who come to the Father through him. So he is our inter, one who is interceding for us, one who is making intercession for us before his Father's throne. And then in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23, he is the Savior of the body. He is the one who is coming back to take his church, his body, his kingdom, and take that church to heaven to be with God the Father and him for all eternity. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29, he nourishes and cherishes his church, his spiritual body, feeding us through his wonderful word, the bread of life, the sustenance that we need spiritually to keep us going while we're here on this earth. And then in John 14, verse 6, He is the only way to the Father. There is no other way given to us in the Scripture to approach the Father, either through prayer while we're here on this earth and by going to heaven in eternity. Only through Jesus can we approach the Father. And then the last passage we just studied, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. He is our refuge. He calls us to come to Him and to receive rest in the midst of our labor for Him. When we think about now all of those passages of Scripture which God has given to us in His Word, and we think about this theme that we've been studying in this particular section of lesson number two, then we ought to rejoice. And we ought to say and think as we sing, truly, what a friend we have in Jesus. And our hope and prayer is that each of us will dwell upon these thoughts and upon these scriptures on a regular and frequent basis.
so that our lives may be more meaningful and filled with purpose and joy and satisfaction in knowing Jesus is there. He is our best friend and He has demonstrated it in so many ways. But since the Father and Jesus have done all of these things to make it possible for us to have Jesus as our best friend, surely we are obligated to return that love to the Lord and to those who are around us in our daily lives. And we want to use that foundation of the fact that Jesus is our best friend to look at some things that should grow out of our recognition of that fact. Our love for the Lord should lead us to do certain things. Let's look at several passages of Scripture to establish that point in the Bible. Let's look first in the book of Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 17 through 19. Ephesians 3, verses 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes uh, knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now God talking through the Apostle Paul tells us that we ought to allow Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith, that we ought to let Him live in us through our faith in Him and through the faith of the gospel of Christ. Allow Christ to live in our hearts. And then he says that we ought to be rooted and grounded in love. We ought to have as our foundation our love for God and His love for us as shown so beautifully in His beloved Son, Jesus. And it ought to keep us rooted and grounded in the gospel that we have such a great show of love that has been given to us by God in His Son. And that's something that is special to us. And he says that we may be able to comprehend or understand with all of the saints the great dimensions of the love of Christ, the height, the depth, the width, the length. God is saying His love is so tremendous that it ought to fill our hearts and minds. It ought to fill our lives. And it ought to be manifested, shown in our lives in serving others. He said that love of Christ passes knowledge. That is, there is no greater show or manifestation of love than that which the Father has shown to us in His beloved Son and than that which Jesus has shown for us in His life, humiliation, suffering, death, blood, resurrection, and ruling in heaven as King of kings and Lord of lords. So we ought to be rooted and grounded in this love of Christ and we ought to know that love of Christ and allow that love to fill our hearts and minds that we might be more like Him every day of our life. Then in the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Paul, at the end of this context, bursts out in thanksgiving to God. And we believe that the gift that he's talking about in this particular context is the gift that those faithful Christians had, been, had given to help other Christians who were in need at that particular time. But what we want to focus in on is that the attitude of thanksgiving expressed by Paul and the way that we ought to follow that example. In our case, we ought to be thankful to God for the gift of 
that He has given to us. We ought to be thankful to God that through His grace, He has made possible salvation through His Son and all that He has done for us and all that He is doing for us today in His capacity as King of kings and Lord of lords. So our hearts ought to be filled with thanksgiving to God and people ought to know this person truly is thankful to God for what He has done for me. Then also in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We ought to allow the love of Christ to constrain us. The word translated constrain means to confine, to restrict. And I believe the idea that God is revealing to us here is that we ought to let Christ's love for us and our love for Him constrict us to the straight and narrow road which He has given to us in His Word, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. We ought to constrain ourselves. We ought to restrict ourselves, deny ourselves of those things that are wrong, and walk in the path that Jesus walked. Follow Him. And our motivation being our love for Him and His love for us. That word also has in it the meaning of it motivates us. It compels us. The love of Christ pushes us to do the things that He says we should do in His Word. That love, if it's rooted and grounded in our hearts, then will motivate us to do something. What does He say in this verse? He talks about the fact that one died for all. We know, of course, the one to whom He was referring was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He died for all mankind, including you and me. And that thought ought to fill our hearts and minds too. And he says, he died for, one died for all, then all had died. And he's talking about all human beings who are responsible, who have the ability to do what God says, died spiritually in their trespasses and sins. And thus, we needed someone to give us the ability to have new life, to be born anew. And of course, that someone was Jesus who came and lived and died so that we can live and live eternally in Him. But then in verse 15, God tells us that Jesus died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves. We should not be selfish. We should not be self-centered. Instead, we should be selfless and centered on others and centered on Jesus. He said we should no longer live for ourselves, but for Him who died for them and rose again. So Jesus died so that we should live for, our, for Himself, not ourselves. Every day of our life then should be dedicated to Him. We should be striving to live His way according to His will. And our motive, our, the propelling force that encourage us, encourages us to do that is our love for Him and His love for, all, for us as manifested in all of the things that we've studied in this particular lesson. So we need to let Christ's love for us and our love 
for Him, constrain us to live for Him who died for us. Then in John's account of the gospel, in chapter 14, verse 15, John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Very simple words, but it requires effort on our part to live those words. Jesus said, here's the test of your love for me. If you truly love me, you'll strive to keep my commandments. You'll strive to be obedient to me. So that love that constrains us, constrains us, compels us to obey Jesus because we love him and because he's manifested his wonderful love for you and me. And we see that thought also in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. <clears throat> I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What a beautiful passage of Scripture that is. Uh, uh, the Apostle Paul here, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is giving us a pattern, a model to follow. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. Now we need to think about when we read that verse, is he saying that he literally was crucified with Christ? No, that's not what he was saying. He was still alive when he wrote those words. Then what is he saying? He's saying that when he was converted to the Lord, when he was willing to obey the gospel of Christ, including his baptism into Christ, that Paul decided he was going to kill his old manner of life. He was going to crucify that old selfish person that he used to be. He was going to nail that old person to the cross and no longer strive to live that selfish, ungodly life. And that's what God wants of us. He wants us to crucify that old person. And He wants us to work daily to strive to have less of us living in us and more of Christ. Paul said, it is not I who lives, but Christ lives in me. Do you see the replacement, the substitution that Paul was talking about? He's tell, say, saying to us, you take yourself and you put yourself down, your selfish desires and interests and wants, and you elevate Christ in your life. You allow Christ to be seen in the way that you think and talk and, speak, and uh, act the deeds you do. And he said, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Do we want to know how it is that we can have Christ living in us? That's the inspired answer. We have to live our lives by the faith of Jesus Christ. That is, by the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have to be reading and filling our hearts and minds with His Word and meditating upon it and striving to live it in our lives. That's how we'll replace ourselves with Jesus Christ in us. And notice the bright uh, ray of hope and the bright joy that is at the end of this passage. Paul said, speaking of Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. To Paul, Jesus was not some abstract person far, far away from his mind. To Paul, Jesus was real, and he was alive, and he knew in his heart that Jesus loved him and gave himself for him, and that pushed him to be the kind of person that he was. And when you and I think that way, we're going to be 
more like Jesus. And that's what God wants us to do. Allow that love to fill our hearts and push us to live like Jesus and for Jesus every day of our life while we're here. Then in the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter and verse 24, Ephesians 5, verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. We want to focus in on the first part of that passage of Scripture. God tells us that the church is to be subject to Christ. That is, the church is, sub is to submit to Christ, to be obedient to Christ, to yield our will to His will. When there is a conflict, we deny ourselves and we do what He says to do. That's something that you and I need to strive to improve in every day, saying to ourselves, we must deny ourselves and we must submit ourselves to Jesus because that's a command from God who is the church. The church is individual Christians purchased with the blood of Jesus. And so he says we ought to submit ourselves to Christ. We ought to be his slaves, his servants, who commit ourselves totally to him, our body, our mind, our soul, all of us needs to be in submission to our Lord Jesus. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, another passage of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of, Christ, of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now we want to focus in on the last part of that particular verse and see that God is telling us that we, have, we ought to bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. Picture in your mind uh, a person who is on a horse and he's uh, going after a calf a small cow, and he has in his hands a rope that he's going to use to throw around the neck of that calf and bring that calf back to him and bring it into captivity. That's the kind of picture language that God is using for you and me here. Sometimes our thoughts stray. They go in directions they ought not to go. They go in areas where God would not have our thoughts to be. So we need to constantly be on guard and be vigilant and bring those thoughts back into captivity. Bring them back under control. With what goal? To the obedience of Christ. That is to the point where we obey Him. Where we do what He wants us to do. So we're talking about a war here, a battle, if you will, a battle for our mind. Satan wants us to stray and to allow our thoughts to stray into areas they don't belong and continue in those areas. But God wants us to maintain self-discipline and self-control and bring our thoughts and our mind under control so that we will obey Christ. And I also think that God is saying, here's the standard of your obedience. That is, here's the pattern of your obedience. What is that? The obedience that Christ showed while He was here on this earth. And as we've seen, He obeyed to the point of death, even the death of the cross, Philippians chapter 2. So God wants us to bring our minds under control, bring our thoughts into captivity, with our goal being obeying Christ and obeying like Christ. Then in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Philippians 1, verse 20 and 21. 
according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What a wonderful passage this is. Paul talks about his great expectation and his hope that he would never do anything that he would be ashamed of. And that's a goal. We know that we do fall short. But we need to have high goals like this, that we would never do anything that we would be ashamed of before God. And then he talks about his desire that Christ should be magnified in his body. What do we think of when we think of something being magnified? We think of something being made larger, being made clear, seen clearly. So what's Paul saying? People ought to be able to see Jesus Christ in our lives. And that was Paul's goal, to live in such a way that people could see in Him Jesus Christ. And that's what we ought to do. Every day we ought to strive to get a little better at showing others Jesus by our thoughts, by our words, by our deeds. And he says, Christ shall be magnified in my body whether by life or by death. Now there's an interesting thought. Paul is saying that whether I live or I die, as I live, I'm going to magnify Christ. I'm going to show Him to others. And even in my death, I am going to show Jesus. I'm going to show my love for Him, my dedication to Him, my willingness to give all for Him, even to die like He died. And in verse 21, he said, For to me to live is Christ. Christ is not something that we put up on the shelf on days other than when we go and worship the Lord or study the Bible with our Christian brothers and sisters. He is our life. Our reason for living, our purpose in life is to be like Him and to live for Him. And if we have that attitude, we will be like Paul in saying that to die is gain. That is, it is profitable. It is valuable. Why? Because the Christian will depart and be with Christ, which is far better, Paul says later in this context in Philippians 1. So we ought to live in such a way that we magnify Show others Jesus and glorify Him in our daily life. We hope that each one of us, including myself, will strive in the period between this class and the next to live in such a way that Christ is magnified by our, in our body, by our life or our death.